All right, you guys. Well, it's really great to um, to see you here, and I'm grateful for for this moment. Um, I think the noises I'm hearing from people is that there's both some really good content to be found today, but it's also there's just a warm <laughs> feeling of kind of checking in, you know, with our peeps <laughs> all together. Uh, and I think that's really important at this time. Um, and yeah, oh, you got your coffee. That's Lucy, is that actually it's coffee? Actually having coffee. Like, it's I've not, it's bottle, too like, late in the day. And, yeah, like, me too. It's tea. So I, I actually am drinking seltzer water, but I put it in a coffee cup just there you go. people would get judgmental. <laughs> We gotta be looking like we're having coffee. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, uh oh. So we're we're gonna. You know, I think the the thing with this virtual kind of festival is like we have to kind of let ourselves off the hook. It's the first time we're doing this. Yeah. And there's gonna be some technical issues. You know, give it another month of quarantine, and we're gonna be pros at this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody will be. A month might even be optimistic, um, but. I think uh, I, I don't think anybody minds terribly, you know, if we're not like super slick and professional from our. Yeah. So okay, so so quickly um, to my right, left, screen right <laughs> is Ngozi, uh, who uh, many of you were probably on the last session with Kirk talking about. It was awesome, actually, that that session on the on the the coloring. That was beautiful. And I feel like in some ways, you know, uh, so just to do the intro piece, you know, Check Please is this mega popular uh, web comic that is also one of the graphic novels we, we published. The second one, which closes out the story, um, is, now, is now out. And, and, um, and Check Please is, yeah, it's... It's hockey, it's bros, it's romance, it's baking pies. Uh, it's just this really unusual combination that just like you were saying in the previous session, and goes the um, the super specific, you know, the super specific um, story, the super specific setting, super specific characters, obviously resonates, you know, and has connected with many, many people, many readers. Uh, for a very good reason. And I feel like um, I hadn't actually seen this presentation of yours, which I really enjoyed. Like, I, you know, I know with all the technical glitches, but it was, I, I love, you know, they're beautiful panels, like the stuff you're doing with the color holds. And like, and I feel like the conversation around check please is understandably about other things, you know, and like a world without toxic masculinity. And like, you know, it's some really good conversations have sprouted around check please. Um, but I, I feel like it, it's not always acknowledged just how beautiful your work is and, and you know, the, your, your artistry is, is a treat. Um, and so that was good to kind of dive into that. But anyway, so, so Ngozi is here. Jean uh, was in an earlier session, uh, the first one kicking off things today. And, um, and Jean has been you know, with for a second from the from the beginnings, basically, and and the, the the launch and the setup of it, and and throughout many different kinds of projects, has been developing his own works, like solo projects, and collaborations. And some of the collaborations include things like um, Secret Coders with Mike Holmes doing the art, um, but also working with Guri Hiru on the Avatar Last Airbender comics for Dark Horse, and then DC actually writing the Chinese Superman, you know, writing Superman Smashes the Clan, which is coming out this month. And, you know, some pretty incredible accolades and awards and honors that have never been given to a comics person before. Um, but also being uh, a very, a very decent human being, you know, and, and never really changing throughout all this. And I feel like since 2006, pretty much, every time something unprecedented happens with Eugene, I feel like we're like, okay, there's nowhere higher to go from here. And then 
boom, next year you kind of top that, you know, with like a MacArthur Genius Award or National Ambassador of Children's Literature, you know, <laughs> these things. But I think what I love best is that you really, there's a part of you that really never changes and that's just you, you know, you are you year nice, after year. Nice. Like you don't nice to turn into something, you know, else. It's, it's a lovely thing. Um, and then Lucy, okay, can you hear Lucy? You can hear, right? Huh? No. Okay. I'm not hearing you, Lucy, and your image is not moving. Yeah. Oh. Okay, well, I'll introduce Lucy anyway while she kind of gets back in here, hopefully. Um, so Lucy has been, um, our first book together was was uh, Relish, My Life in the Kitchen, which was a, a memoir of growing up in a foodie family. And I, I think, I believe she doesn't like um, the term foodie, but um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a really marvelous um, nonfiction a memoir. And... And since then, we've had a number of things where we've basically been journeying with Lucy through her life. Um, and so there's been uh, with with kid gloves in particular. Okay, Lucy, hoping you're back. Okay, so anyway, we, we published one book called Kid Gloves, which was documenting uh, Lucy's pregnancy and quite a dramatic, um, dramatic pregnancy it was. Uh, and she also has a book uh, just out recently from Random House called Stepping Stones. And then this one now with us, which is I Miss You Go to Sleep, which is like small vignettes of her, of a new newborn and an infant and a toddler, um, which is really lovely. And I guess uh, she won't hear me say nice things about her, but uh, <laughs> hopefully she'll be back. <laughs> Um, so I, I hope, um, I hope Lucy will find her way back to this and our apologies to everybody. Uh, we're getting, getting acquainted to the, this system. Um, but anyway, so I, I, I don't know, maybe you guys, uh, have something up front that you'd like to say. Um, I also have a bunch of really, some really good questions from, audience members uh, so we could play with those if you'd like yeah that sounds great just to do questions what do you think and go yeah cool thumbs up yeah let's do yeah. questions okay. yeah yeah so okay so here's a, a nice kind of basic one uh from the diaz family uh they're asking how old were you when you made your first comic and what was it about mm. And they range. I mean, some of these questions are like very specific. Yeah. Some of them are really big. You'll see. I mean, there's some. You, you, have, you have an answer? Oh, no. Go ahead. I'll think. <laughs> okay. So I, I, um, I made my very first comic in fifth grade. It was with my best friend, Jeremy Kuniyoshi. We're still in touch. We're, we, we got back in touch through Facebook maybe 10 years ago. But he's not making comics anymore. He's now um, a radiologist. So he, okay. he makes bucket loads of money. But our, our comic was about this character that we created who was kind of a ripoff of uh, Robin Hood. He was a superhero. He had a, a discus of death that he would throw at people's heads. That was no superpowers, just this <laughs> discus that he would throw at people's heads. And that discus was actually inspired by this toy that my brother and I had, we used to have this plastic disc swing in our backyard. So it was a plastic disc with a, with a rope that hung from the middle of it. And you could hang it on a tree. And unlike a, a regular swing, you could swing in any direction. You could swing like 360 if you wanted. And that lasted like about a week before it broke off. And then we would just <laughs> throw it at each, each other's heads. And that, that was the, the inspiration of our superhero comic. So, <laughs> very nice, very nice. Um, I, I, I guess I had always been drawing and I didn't realize that I was making comics 
But when I was in fandom, when I was about like 13 or 14, I would just just make, I actually made a lot of Avatar The Last Airbender fan art. Awesome. I have awesome. so many comics for Avatar. Um, so I, I just was making work. And I don't think I made my first like official till And that's when I made a web comic, which was very touch and go. It wasn't check, please. It was another story. Yeah. I, I, I guess I never sat down to think about making a comic until college when I mm. made my first uh, mm. web comic. Your your schooling project. <laughs> yeah, schooling. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think that's kind of amazing. I, I feel like you uh, had some kind of a head start, or like your start was really fast. You know what I mean? I, I feel like for a lot of us. It takes maybe ten years or something to to kind of get the hang of things, but for you to get to to do what you did in college is, I don't know, dude. That's pretty impressive. It's funny yeah. because I think people also, if I'm talking like this, I know everyone here can understand me and speak, but just yeah, because yeah. <laughs> the internet's not great. No, it worked. Um, but uh, I think fandom was the first place my experience mm. drawing and telling stories and lucy who is here her, her digital group, um we're actually in a, the same fandom right now which we were both back in 10 years ago mm. like you still get you get a lot of experience in storytelling from writing fan fiction and creating fan art and fan yeah and Lucy agrees it's funny you know it's interesting there's something weird about the place of Avatar Last Airbender in all of us and we're you know we're definitely we're different generations but we're um I feel like that that creation had has um an incredible incredible influence on so many people yeah it was actually it was yes. you I think it was you and, and Derek Kirkham who brought me onto Avatar Gene. Yeah, Derek got me in. Derek got me in. He he yeah. loaned me the first season on DVD. Yeah, and that. Uh, well, you know, my daughter uh, Cleo, when she was young, uh, actually, she and her brother Julian, they 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 copied. They were tracing from the the Dark Horse. Uh, you know, Dark Horse put out those beautiful mm -hmm. making of Avatar: Last Airbender, and then later the Korra. And they mm -hmm. traced like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of faces, and I feel like they got like an education in facial expressions. You yeah, know, yeah. Tracing Avatar. It's, yeah. It's, uh, it's like the one show that our whole family got hooked on together. Yeah, same thing so, I saw, you know, when I, I they, they got to meet Brian Konietzko, who's one of the creators of Avatar. They got to meet him at, uh, at a San Diego Comic-Con some years ago. And now he's signed up with for a second. He has an enormous, mm -hmm. ambitious project with us. But when they met him, they actually were quizzing him with lines from the show. And they were like, <laughs> so who said that? And he was like, they stumped him. You know, they're like, no, no, that was top season three. <laughs> nice. But yeah, it's fandom, like I think a place of fandom, that's a, it's a different thing now than it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. And now I mean, you have fans. I like. Oh. I could talk about Avatar The Last Airbender extensively and in, in how uh, we all kind of maybe interacted with Avatar The Last Airbender uh, in different ways for the first time. I was watching 15, 16, 17. Um, yeah. And uh, Mark, you're saying that uh, I, it kind of cut off. Did you say quizzing Brian and stuff or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you were familiar, like, were you a fan before you got to write those? Because that's that's like the. I was. Dream. I was. A, I was a fan. Like, like, so we came into it a little bit late. Um, I remember the very first time I heard about it. I was uh, a computer science high school teacher, 
And my students would talk about it while they were supposed to be working on their projects. You know, like they'd be at their computers, they'd be working on their code, and then they would stop and they'd talk about Avatar Last Airbender. They'd be like, so who do you think is going to be Aang's uh, Earthbender teacher? Or they'd be like, who, uh, who do you think Aang is going to end up with? You know, or is, do you think Aang is going to end up with Katara? And, and it sounded intriguing, but because I was their teacher, I couldn't ask them about it. I had to just tell them to get back to work. And then, and then they oh. loaned me the DVDs and that's kind of when I got into it. So I watched the first and second season on DVD and I think I saw the third in real time, you know? So I was with everybody when they were all, what happened to Zuko's mom, you know, at the very last, at the very last uh, episode. So to go from there to actually work on the, the books was kind of crazy. It was yeah. a nice thing. That, yeah. Yeah. Almost like... Yeah. Hey, so so you kind of um, started. A, I mean, it has the potential to be a franchise, don't you think? Totally. Like Tech Please? Like you could you built a, a, a thorough enough world where you could have other stories and other parts of that campus, right? You totally could. So have you have you seen that? Have, have people been doing that online? Um. Well, I I what I heard your question. Is a franchise? A franchise? Yeah, like a check please franchise. You could totally do that. Like, meaning, are people treating it like that already? Are you seeing fanfic? Yeah. I and and the last part of the question might have been, um, do I see people playing in that world? Yes. A little yes. bit. That, yeah. There's a lot. There is a lot yeah, of fiction right? for check please. There's a lot. Yeah. Don't go and read it. <laughs> um, you can do whatever you want but there is quite a bit of fan fiction for check please um and i i like that I, I was speaking with um a i was speaking with marissa mayer who's fantastic mm -hmm. and i think things about making art is that people can you know crawl into the world and mm -hmm. start their own fandom experiences it kind of comes full circle i learned how to tell stories and make comics through fandom so if people are doing that through my comics and stories then you know yeah that's really cool that's so great it is it's so it's, it's awesome yeah it's amazing that, that's something i i think that yeah marissa meyer with her lunar chronicles there's some an incredible explosion of, of fan art there that's just really pretty amazing uh, yeah. but yeah I mean with you I feel like your your connection with with the fans of Check Please is is like a unique thing it's like a very special thing you you built you know and it's like uh that that's like the times we're in you know it's and I think the webcomic I mean we could probably have a whole long interesting session about the phenomenon of webcomics and what what it says you know about our times and how it's shaping creativity and storytelling and um but it's great well, do you think that that's part of what's going to happen after this that web comics are i mean web comics i feel like are already pretty prominent do you think they're going to grow in importance because we're all doing everything in front of our screens now i don't know i'm not sure i, I and i would even like to hear your guys takes on that web comics as far as i know they haven't changed too much. They've just moved to different platforms. We read webtoons right now. Mm -hmm. You guys heard of like webtoons? Barely, but you should explain. Mm -hmm. Next yeah, thing, we're, thing. We're, I'm, I'm old and out of touch, so. Okay, well, okay. That's, but like, so a lot of like comics, but you know, I would find them from journal forums and different recommendations. Now, a lot of um, kids, they go right on webtoons and that's where they're reading their first comics usually. That's mm. not, you know, in print format, which they probably would get from school, but they're, they're going online to these huge, huge, yeah. So, maybe ask one, uh, point out one more thing with web comics. Uh, younger people are reading them on their 
lists are formatted to be these lists, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. we all grew up making pages. Mm -hmm. So I will mean for you know, future stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that's an interesting thing to figure out how to make yeah. comics that are friendly to both print and uh, and screen, right? Yeah. I, it's it's going to become more and more of a, a challenge, or, or more important. It'll become more prominent. Yeah, and some things are more, I think, more suited to it than others, but, but it's also, um, I think, the experience of interacting with a story is... Mm -hmm is always going to be a, a very appealing to some people and like, you know, following a story. It's like, if you followed check, please, you know, and you've gone through, mm -hmm. you know, year one and you know, you're, you're, you've gone through the sophomore experience and you're like, you know, you're, you're, you're invested yourself. Like you're, yeah. you're um, you have a different relationship to that book, but I still, I also think that we're, we're seeing that people really need books um, and want books and it's like, and I feel like some of, you know, your experience um, with us, with, with for a second, you know, it's like, it's the, the publishing has brought check please in to, to people who never read a web comic, you know, and who are passionate about it for them. That's their, that's their book, you know, that's the one. And they don't have any, you know, other web comic connection. So that's interesting too. Hmm. Yeah. And I still think that it's odd that the webcomic is 100% like online, the bend, it reaches, it's yeah. reaching a totally different audience of people who never do. It's yeah. something about the page or something about holding a comic that does something. Yeah. Or, yes. This, this was actually an argument that I had with uh, Derek pretty early on, you know, way, way back when we were in our, our 20s. Um, and he was serializing Same Difference, which is now first, second book. He put the whole thing up online and then um, he, he got the book printed. So it began as a, as a self-published book. And I was like, you need to take some of those pages off, right? You need to take like two thirds of those pages off. Otherwise, why would anybody buy the book? And he's like, no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And he was totally right. It, was. it ended up being fine. So I, I do think that that ties into what's happening right now. Um, I think um, I, I have heard from it within some retailer communities that they're a little bit worried about how uh, online content is going to affect physical sales, you know, especially when things go back to as close to normal as, as they will be. But I, I wonder if there's also a, a lesson from that, you know, that um, that developing a relationship with characters and with a story through the screen can often drive the demand for the the print. You know, there, I, I think there's a way of figuring that relationship out where we can use it to to save these stores that we we yeah. you know know and love. Yeah, yeah. I do think with comics in particular. You know, I mean, if you're reading, if I'm reading a, a, a novel, you know, an airport novel, it's okay on a device. You know, I think with, like with First Second so far, you know, it's been mostly the, the ebook sales. Most of our books are on ebook, but they're in the hundreds, you know, it's like, yeah. it's pretty yeah. much insignificant, basically. Yeah. And that may change. I'm not saying, you know, I know, but. Um, I feel like the first second reader is someone who treasures that object yeah. you know, and, and the care yeah. that's gone into making it and all these things. Yeah. I, I mean, I think and it's, it's partially because first second, like pretty much every designer I've, I've worked with, you know, it, 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 including Kirk who, who did such an amazing job on, on uh, dragon hoops, they have made it so that the book as object is like a very different experience from reading it online, right? Or reading it through a screen. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, definitely. yeah check, check Please turned out great. Who did yeah. the design on Check Please? I think, was it originally, uh, was it Colleen that started on the first one? And then Andrew? I think so, yeah. It, it's been through several generations of our, okay. it's like our, our art directors kind of go on to their own projects sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, it turned out beautiful. Hey, are you saying something? 
I'm very happy the way it did because, mm -hmm. you know, when I was making the book, I wasn't painted, but, you know, just even stacking the panels turned out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. better than I had hoped. It's still the only thing that I regret. You can't do splash paste. I mean, mm. it's a moment where Biddy finally checks somebody, and I would have loved that to be like yeah. a double page spread, but it, <laughs> mm. I'm locked into this. So it looks good on the screen, though, when yeah. someone's mm -hmm. clicking through. It's an amazing picture. It's an amazing picture. And it's still, I mean, they, they print beautifully. Oh, I mean, I think the stuff with the lights, the stuff you do with the lighting at night, it's just like, it's it's a joy to, to look at. And I enjoy gazing at, you know, a printed Thanks. piece. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. Wait, I actually... Okay, wait, let me look at these pictures. It's too bad we don't have Lucy, but I think technical problems are prevailing. Yeah. I'm sorry, Ngozi, what were you saying? Oh, um, so I actually got to interview Jean like two weeks ago on IG Live. That was fun. That was fun. That was awesome. Me, but I would, it was a it's conversation. Out, right. It was um, super fun. I'll ask you this question. Um, in Dragon Hoops, you talk so much about like your circle of life, work, comics, but you just finished another comic. Or how are you filling in? Like, what are your next projects? I'm, I'm in the I'm in something. a period of being lost <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, it's no. it's really weird because because I I think um I think in normal times I'd be walking around I'd be I'd be doing something outside of my house to, to to try to figure out what my next story idea is right. Whereas now I'm like stuck. I'm stuck at home, and I'm sort of I'm sure it's it's true for for you all too. Like I feel like my day is kind of cut up. And it's not, it's not regimented the way it used to be. It's not like I, I can spend this much time on work and this much time on family. Family and work kind of bleed into each other. You know, I'll be working on something and then a kid will come in and ask a question. And it'll happen like every 10 to 15 minutes or something. So I'm, I, I feel like I'm kind of, I'm in a period of, of, of being lost. I, I feel like I'm a little bit in the wilderness and we'll see what happens. Hopefully something awesome, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> hopefully it'll be, it'll be okay. One of the questions that caught me here, um, I'm looking through a ton of really good ones, but there's um, Garrett Solomon asked, how do you feel when you finished your work and it's out there in the open for all the public to read? Which I think is, is really interesting because I think it's different for different people. I mean, some people have like a period of depression. It's like when you actually let it go. Um, what's it like for you when you kind of let, let your work go? And, and for Ngozi, it's twice, right? It's once on the yeah. screen and once on the page. So do they feel different? Yes. So when I actually get to, okay, so it's actually been a very new experience because for um, the book, for, for Sticks and Scones, I had to finish everything before uh, you know, like posting it online, which I was really, really I was so angry. I was like, I just want to keep posting. You can't stop me from posting, man. Um, but it was fine. And I realized that when I didn't have to share everything constantly, when I wasn't posting on Tumblr and waiting for feedback, that the boulder with my storytelling, I could be a little with my storytelling. Um, so this time getting to see everybody read everything at once, kind of in, when the book came out, um, I don't, it's, it's, it still feels so strange to see people mm. react to your, know if that makes, I mean, do you guys feel that too? Like in this case, people were crying because check please was over. I had already That's awesome. said goodbye afters. So I was a little like, oh, yeah, no, this was finished a long time ago, guys. I, <laughs> the story has, has always been done. I do, do I have like, some emotional problem? I don't know. I, I was very You were just ahead. People. You were ahead emotionally. <laughs> That's right. You right. You're, yeah, you're ahead. Yeah. I, I personally, I, I, uh, I really actually don't like reading my own stuff after it gets published 
Because, I mean, part of it is you have to read it over and over and over again while you're working on it, right? Like, going through the copy editing and stuff. And by the time it gets out, I'm just like, if I read it again, I'm going to look, I'm going to see all these mistakes that are going to make me feel sad. And I don't, I don't want to read it again. But you have to, like, you have to, like, at readings and stuff, you have to. But um, I don't like it. How much? Oh, you cut out there. Oh, I was going to ask, how, how about you? What's it like for you to have your book out? Oh, for me? Yeah, there is a period of, um, I feel, it was, it's kind of a, a, I feel like you go, I go cold to a project when it's finished. And then other people get warm to it, hopefully, if it's, you know, if it, if it uh, finds an audience. And, and so when people are getting warm to it, I'm usually starting to get warm towards a, a new project. Um, mm. So, so I, and, I, and I do, I cool. You know, I, sometimes it's interesting looking back, um, you know, because I had my first picture books were like in 2003 or four. And, and what I thought were my better picture books, like 10 years later or, or 15 years later, are not always the same. Mm. You know, and I pick up something and I'm like, oh, this thing that I thought was just a piece of shit that I really... <laughs> you know, it was just all I could see for years were just the flaws in it, and it was just clunky and awkward and clumsy. And then I, I look at it twelve, fifteen years later, and it and the flaws are more endearing than anything. And but then I see this one actually had like a real life to it, hmm. you know. Whereas another thing that I thought was like really hot is like it's okay, you know. It's like, but so I think my relationship to projects changes over time. Um, and yeah, it's, when it's you say that you feel, when, when you say that you feel work, is it more like, is it loss of interest? Is it, because for me, I, I get loss of interest. I'm like, no, I'm, I explored everything with this. I'm moving on. And it, yeah. it's less, for me, it's less like, oh, these are well, laws. It's more just. <laughs> Sorry, check, please, fans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think there's a bit of that. I think there's a bit of that, and I think it's. I think that's healthy. You know, I think it's part of your. I mean, it's a little bit like you know. It's a little bit like gestation and 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 bearing a child. You know, for at least you know at, at one level. But it's like you know, there's a release, and it's like it has its life, and it's. You know, it's, and maybe there's a period of marketing, like, which is like, yeah, help it walk, you know, but then, but then it's got to go yeah. make it. After, after I have a kid, I lose interest in them totally. <laughs> <laughs> after five years, man, you know, <laughs> I think my kids are probably listening. Right? <laughs> okay, let me just check on some good questions here. We've got, um, that was interesting. Okay, here's one that's really kind of dear to my heart um, from Danielle. Uh, what routines or habits or practices do you keep or lack thereof to support your creative life? Well, uh, my, my routines have kind of, uh, they, they went out the window once uh, quarantine happened. You know, I used to um, go to the gym in the morning and I had a meditation practice. I, uh, I, uh, I would, um, take super cold showers in the morning too. Like I, like at the end of a shower, I'd turn it super cold. Um, just cause I thought like it'd be a way for, to help me get over fear. Like if I'm, if I'm not afraid of super cold water, I'm not going to be afraid of the blank page. And it was kind of stupid, but that's what I was thinking. And all of that has gone out the window with quarantine. So I'm trying to rebuild a, a, a daily practice. So right now, part of the reason it all went out the window is because a lot of that stuff I did, after the kids were at school and I was alone and I just don't have that. I'm never away from my kids now. Never. They're always around. So right now we, um, we do like a seven minute workout as a family in the morning and then we eat breakfast together. And my wife has like a ritual that goes with breakfast. Like we do affirmations and stuff. And, um, and then I start my work day, but I need to, like, I need to build in meditation again. Cause my, I feel like my brain is just like not settled. How about, How about you? you? Um, for me, like I've just figured out that in in normal in regular times, I could 
you know, a little bit more of a looser schedule. I mm -hmm. have my running group. I run with a bunch of moms. It's fantastic. Um, and, and I could do that. But now if I don't go outside first thing in the morning and absorb the sun, I mm -hmm. will be probably ruined for the rest, rest of yeah. So I hope maybe I can bring that into when we return to semi-normal times that I can bring that habit back in. Yeah. Um, um, what else? I also have gotten a lot better. When I was in my early 20s, I would just work in like there was no separation. I've gotten mm -hmm. better recently at stopping work at like five or six o'clock yeah. or seven o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> so... And then that time is time or watching two friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. I feel like this is an area that we could, um, I'd, I'd love to explore that further because I feel like there's a lot, a lot to offer for, especially for young artists. Um, and like, I think building, building a good routine that supports you creatively can be like, a super enhancement, you know, and, I, and I, unfortunately we're, we're running out of time for, for today. And, but I feel like that would be a good thing to get into. I have a, I have like a question for you guys. And I don't know if you encounter this with people you mentor or just students. Like, I think one of the most frustrating things I see is when people are too hard on themselves and they can't allow themselves to make work because it'll be mediocre and they don't, don't even want it to be mediocre. Right. So yeah. they never start a project. Like, yeah. And, and the funny yeah. thing is that, that happens to me as well when I'm writing a comic, like I just, my writer's block is my refusal to get to the first draft. Um, yeah. Can you guys speak on that? Like, how do you, how do you coach someone through that? Oh, or coach man. yourself through that? I mean, it's, yeah, I think, I think one, one secret is, is the regularity, you know, and like, I mean, there's so many people like Stephen King in his memoir talks about, you know, he never misses a day. He's always warm. So it's like, no matter what, if he's feeling hungover or, you know, really inspired or just totally blank, he, it doesn't matter. He's there. He shows up. Right? And you get that idea over and over. And I feel like, for a lot of young people, that's almost like the secret that they need to hear early on. You know, I think Tennessee Williams said, like, I only work when I'm inspired, but fortunately that happens every day at 9 a.m., <laughs> you know. Um, but but I think this idea of showing up um, can be really powerful in, like, whatever you apply it to. But that includes yeah. the creative life. And, and, and it's also a way of, like, it's regardless of... Um, the result being brilliant, you know, it's like, it takes away the judgment. It's like you show up and you crank it out. You know I mean? It's a bit like a good exercise. I think is someone to who, who's running into that problem is the artist's way, you know, which sounds really kind of, okay. you know, but the, the artist's way, just the first two exercises from that book are really brilliant. And it's basically, you just crank out three pages every morning. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and it's incredible, just a little gentle discipline like that has like the most astonishing results. And people have to kind of work through their own judgment about what they're producing. And it's like, it doesn't matter. You're gonna get it out. And then you start to see like what happens when you stay warm and, and primed. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're going and once, and I feel like with comics, especially like with graphic novels being such beasts, you know, it's just so much work. You have to be a little nuts to do this business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But you, you need to stay warm. Momentum is everything in comics. I think getting momentum, you know, be much better than perfect, beautiful panels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> momentum. Mm -hmm. I, I tell my I tell my own kids all the time. I tell them, don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. Um, I. Uh, I heard somewhere, I don't know if this is true or not, but I, I heard somewhere that uh, the Muslim artists who make tapestries, if they get to the very end of one of the tapestries and everything turned out perfectly, at the very end, they'll put a small flaw oh, in, in the very corner, right? And, and they do that because um, yeah. because perfection belongs to God alone. 
And and I think um, I I don't know. I I personally find a lot of uh, comfort in that particular story, whether it's true or not. I'm not totally sure if it's true, because when I look at a page, I can always like a page that I drew. I can always see flaws, and I could like work on that page over and over again for the rest of my life if I wanted to, and it still won't be perfect. But what gets me to move on is to think, well, all the flaws that are there, they're there because perfection belongs to to God alone. This is great. I wish we could keep hanging out like this, but I think we're wrapping up. We actually, I thought I had like about 10 other questions that were um, worth uh, bringing up here. It's really too bad that Lucy um, couldn't yeah. join us, uh, but I really like this format also. I, 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 I hope it's enjoyable and useful for our listeners and viewers. Um, but you're, you know, you're people I, I really admire. I feel it's a great honor to work with you. Um, and I, you know, I feel it's, uh, you, you, you put some good stuff into this world, you know, and we need some good stuff now more than ever. You know, this is like lift and real good, good food for, for minds and souls and hearts out there. And um, so I, I definitely uh, want to champion what you do. You know, I'm proud to do so. It's been it's been great to be a part of this. I'm I'm also sorry that we didn't get to talk to Lucy too. We we hadn't heard from her all day, and I was looking forward we'll to it. We'll but her to stuff is awesome. Definitely freedom. go check it out if they haven't already. Yeah. All right, you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.